Let's turn in our Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 4. We're looking tonight at Jeremiah 4 and 5, title of our study, The Heart of the Problem. You should know that these prophetic books, well, and all the information we gain from them, well, they took place in a historical context. And all that means is while we get some of the history of what was going on specifically or locally, the bigger picture helps us really understand how the children of Judah ended up so far from the heart of God when they had been so greatly blessed by God. Back in 2 Kings 18, and you don't need to turn there, but if you're a note taker, you might want to jot it down and later go take a look. There was a king named Hezekiah. The children of Israel had already stumbled, and in Judah, well, they were having real problems as well. And Hezekiah comes to the throne, and uh, he reigns and reforms for well, a good long season. He's 25 when he becomes king. He reigns for 29 years. And here's what we know about him. And you'll read this as you go through Kings and Chronicles and such. You'll either get this or something we'll share with you later in the study. He did what was right in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father had done. They'll either compare a king to David, and, and that's always going to be a good thing. Because in spite of David's sin, God was very fond of him. Called him a man after his own heart. Well, here's some of the things that Hezekiah did. He removed the high places. He broke the sacred pillars. He cut the wooden images and broke in pieces the bronze serpent, listen, that Moses had made. For until those days, the children of Israel burned incense to it and called it Nehushtan. This is interesting. Remember that crisis in the wilderness where serpents were biting the people because the people had been, well, as they were prone to do, complaining against the Lord. And they were instructed, Moses was instructed to make a bronze serpent and hold it up and whoever looked upon the serpent would live. Now, that all worked out well. Whoever did look just like us looking at the cross, and Jesus, of course, grabs hold of that image and says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The problem is they started worshiping the bronze serpent. They made a little idol of it. And when Hezekiah came on the scene, he just busted that thing up and said, it's just a piece of brass. It was never about the object in Moses' hand. It's that he was obeying the Lord and they were obeying the Lord. And so we're going to see it's going to be like that most of the time. Well, one of the great things that happens late in his life, Hezekiah as that is, is when the northern kingdom had been devastated and the Assyrians were literally at the door of Jerusalem. Hezekiah is freaking out and praying and he's like, what's going to happen here? The Lord's like, hey, don't worry about it. I got this. And in one night, many of you will remember, one angel wipes out 185,000 Assyrians. So when they get up in the morning and they're short 185,000 guys, they decide to go home. So that's, that's sort of like the good news. The bad news that follows it, though Hezekiah was a great king, a mighty reformer, Manasseh followed him, and Manasseh was a very wicked king. He rules for 55 years, and during his reign, man, everything that, that Hezekiah had undone, he redid and doubled down. There were idols everywhere, not just in the north and out in the boonies. He brought idols into the very temple of God. And the temple itself was in disarray. They, they, they really weren't taking care of it. They didn't really care about it, nor did they care about the one who gave them the temple. 
Well, he ruled for 55 years, then he dies. He was a wicked king, by the way. I don't have to tell you that. His son Ammon reigned next. He only reigned for two years because he was so bad, his own servant killed him. And, uh, and then after Ammon, we get Josiah. Now, I've walked you to this part for this very important reason. Josiah and Jeremiah are born about the same time. By the way, Josiah, very, very famous, very popular in Sunday school. Why? He began ruling when he was eight years old. And so, you know, the kids, they're like, hmm, running the roost at eight. Uh, sounds good to me. But the thing is, he was a really good and godly king, a righteous reformer. He rules and reigns for 31 years. Now, around his late teens, because in the early days, you got to know he's being mentored and cared for. It's doubtful that he was doing that much. But, but as soon as he saw what was going on and what should be going on, well, he began to make some mighty reforms. He set out, by the way, to repair and, and restore the temple. And as they were doing that, they discovered the law of God. Now, it had been lost. Can you imagine? You have the actual word of God. You're the only people on the planet who have it, and somehow you misplace it. But I'm thinking, hey, that can happen to us, can't it? Have you looked for your Bible lately only to say, I'm not finding it no matter where I look. We have a lost and found. I encourage you, go take a pee. Sometimes it can happen. But, but my point is this. They lost the word itself, and yet it was in the temple. Sometimes people have drifted far from the Lord, and all it takes is them finding their way back to church because, well, if it's a church like ours, and there are many where godly men who love the Lord and love the word and love the people of God and love the lost open his word and teach it with clarity and simplicity. I do appreciate that I was raised under such a man and I have done everything in my power to be that same kind of man. So no matter who you are, if you've never been in church before, you've been in church all your life, that you would come and you'd understand what's being taught. It would all make sense to you. And that God would use his word as only he can to transform each and every one of our lives. Well, anyway, after he finds the word of God, or they find it and they let him know, he gathers the people and well, first he reads it himself. Then he gathers all the people together and he, he reads it to them. When he reads it himself, he's just weeping and shredding his clothes. And he's like, God, we have so messed this up. He knew something was wrong. He just didn't know how wrong things really were. I imagine it would be like if some of our politicians, those in high places, all of a sudden discovered the word of God and knew it to be the word of God and actually read it with that understanding. I think we'd see some changed people. In any case, the king gathers, and this is in 2 Kings 23. Last thing I have to share with you, and then we'll jump into our passage here tonight. The king sent to gather all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. He went up to the house of the Lord with the priests and the prophets and all the people, small and great. He read it in their hearing. I made mention, I just wanted to read it to you. All the words of the book of the covenant, which had been found in the house of the Lord. And the king stood by a pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to follow the Lord, to keep his commandments, his testimonies, his statutes with all his heart and all his soul to perform the words of this covenant that were written in this book. And all the people took a stand for the covenant. 
Josiah completely cleansed the temple at this point. He burned the idols. He removed the idolatrous priests, and there were many. He went north up into Samaria and destroyed the shrines there and executed the priest. Down in the south, he's like, you're fired. Up there, he's like, you're dead. And so he was getting bolder and more aggressive as he realized how, how bad these things really were. Well, beyond all that, he returns to Jerusalem and they celebrate the Passover. And in verse 22 of 2 Kings 23, let me read it to you. Such a Passover surely had never been held since the days of the judges who ruled Israel, nor in all the days of the kings of Israel and the kings of Judah. Why was this Passover different than the others? Because it was participated in by people whose hearts were broken, whose lives had been shattered because of sin, and now they're right with God. I would hope as we break bread later in this time together, as we take the cup, the same thing would happen that God would break our hearts for our sin, the sin of, of those around us, the sins of those that despise us, that we would have a heart like Jeremiah's, who, by the way, has a heart like Jesus. Well, Josiah's report card, I said I was going to get into the passage, but I have a couple more things, just a couple, I promise. Josiah's report card, straight A's. The people, not so much. They're getting all Fs, you see. And after Josiah, Jehoahaz rules next, he'll actually be taken captive to Egypt. And then the Babylonians attack when the next king, Jehoiakim, is ruling. This is the first siege, by the way. That's the one in which Daniel will be taken to Babylon with his friends. Then the second siege, Jehoiachin, uh, is uh, ruling at that time. And I don't have to tell you, all these guys are bad guys. Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, Zedekiah, they're all bad kings. Ezekiel and others are taken in that second siege. There are actually three separate sieges. The third is the, the worst. That's when Zedekiah is actually ruling. He did evil in the sight of the Lord. And uh, Nebuchadnezzar shows up. He burns Jerusalem. He shreds the temple. He destroys the houses. He kills or takes captive most of the people, leaving just a few in the land to keep the crops that survived this unbelievable and believable judgment of God. Well, all of that, of course, is future at this point, because at this time, well, Josiah and Jeremiah, having worked together since they were in their latter teens, they're in their 20s, no doubt, and, and there are some things that God starts saying to Jeremiah, and that's where we pick up in our story. If you will return, Jeremiah 4.1, if you will return, O Israel, says the Lord, return to me. And if you will put away your abominations out of my sight, then you shall not be moved. What's he saying? Return to me, repent of your sin, and I'll restore you. It's the same message to them again and again and again. And when they don't listen, well, judgment comes. And then, well, he cries out again, repent, be restored, repent, be restored. He says in verse 2, you shall swear the Lord lives in truth, in judgment, and in righteousness. The nations shall bless themselves in him, and in him they shall glory. Not only does he promise to, to bless Judah, the southern tribes there living in Judah, but he promises that the call he gave to Abraham and among the many things he said to Abraham in the covenant he made with Abraham is you will be a blessing. He meant him specifically. He meant his descendants. Ultimately, he mentions one descendant, our Lord and Savior, 
who would be a blessing to all nations in ways no one else could. Actually redeeming individuals and redeeming nations. So, so what he's saying is, if you'll return to me, I'll restore you, and you'll be the blessing I separated you to be. For thus says the Lord. And you know, if you've been tracking through these prophetic books, we're only in our second, we started in Isaiah and now Jeremiah. But if you're tracking in the prophets, thus says the Lord could only mean two things. Someone has stood in the presence of God, heard from the Lord, and now he's speaking for the Lord. Or somebody hadn't done any of those things, and yet they still come saying, thus says the Lord. We're going to see that both are happening. But this is Jeremiah. Thus says the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, break up your fallow ground. And do not sow among thorns, circumcise yourselves to the Lord. Take away the foreskin of your hearts. You men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my fury come forth like fire and burn so that no one can quench it because of the evil of your doings. What's he telling them to do? Prepare your hearts for the good seed of my word. Hard hearts, weedy hearts, out of the way hearts, they're all going to fail because the word of God has to take root in order to produce fruit. Humble, repentant, receptive hearts. That's why I entitled this the heart of the problem because at the heart of the problem, it's always a problem of the heart. And that's what he sees in his people. And that's what he's calling to change. He's not saying you need to get back to the temple. You need to start offering sacrifice. You need to start. No, he's saying you need to prepare your heart. Because when people do find their way back to us, but their heart's not receptive to him, all they do is hear stuff that could have and should have changed them. But because the heart is hard and unprepared, they leave more condemned, not less condemned. More confused, not less confused. Well, this is our need tonight, I believe. I always pray, God, use me. But, but I know for him to speak through me, he needs to speak to me. So I, I'm outlining because, well, I'm teaching. But I'm not relying on the outline. I'm relying on the Holy Spirit. Because what I can't know, the heart of each and every one of you, God knows. And he says, we're so, well, we're so depraved and deceitful that, that our hearts are deceitful and desperately wicked. We don't even always know our own heart. How can we know them? He'll reveal them. Lord, show me. If my heart is straying, if my heart isn't right, if my heart's not prepared for you and for your word. Well, declare in Judah, verse 5, proclaim in Jerusalem, blow the trumpet in the land, cry, gather together and say, assemble yourselves and let us go into the fortified city, set up the standard toward Zion, take refuge, do not delay, for I will bring disaster from the north and great destruction. Why is God warning them that judgment's coming? Because the, the direction had already been chosen. While there were always some, and there will always be some, that hear the Lord and respond appropriately to the Lord. Repenting of sin, trusting in him, obeying him. The majority was getting it wrong. The majority was heading the wrong dire direction. So he says, look at, let them know. This is a word to the watchman, the watchman on the wall. To, to put up the standard and, and blow the trumpet and, and warn the people, judgment's come and head for the hills. It's your only hope, he's saying at this point. The lion, verse 7, has come up from his thicket. The destroyer of nations is on his way. He's gone forth from his place to make your land desolate. Your cities will be laid waste without inhabitant. For this, clothe yourself with sackcloth. 
lament and wail for the fierce anger of the Lord has not turned back from us. And it shall come to pass in that day, says the Lord, that the heart of the king shall perish and the heart of the princes and the priests shall be astonished. And the prophets shall wonder, wonder what? What went wrong, they're going to say. God's trying to tell them. Your hearts drifted and went the other direction. You went after idols instead of me. You got involved in immorality instead of purity. So, so five words, lion, king, princes, priests, and prophets. The lion here is speaking of Babylon. It was a symbol for Babylon. In fact, if you Google it, don't do it now. But if you Google it, you can go to images, you'll see all these different images of lions. They were very, very fond of, of, you know, placing them everywhere. They made statues of lions. Some of them have wings. So they're like, like flying lions coming to get you. But, but here's the thing. Just like here in the United States, it's the eagle. That's our national symbol, right? Theirs was the lion. It's in Daniel, by the way, which for us is yet ahead. But, but Daniel in Daniel 7 sees a, a similar vision to the one that Nebuchadnezzar has back in Daniel 2, only when, when Nebuchadnezzar sees that he sees the glory of kingdoms of men and the head of gold and the chest of silver. And you, you should be familiar. If not, just read Daniel and you will be. But, but when Daniel gets the same story, he gets it from heaven's perspective. And instead of this glorious kingdoms of men, he sees four ravenous beasts beginning with the lion. And again, that represents Babylon. The difference is this is being told prior to the Babylonian captivity, but it's coming and it's coming quickly. Daniel, when he has his vision, he's already been taken captive. He's already learned how to thrive, not just survive, but thrive in the midst of the most perverse and corrupt and idolatrous nation on the planet in its day. Somehow he kept things right with God. Well worth reading that book, and we'll read it together some months out. Well, we also know Satan goes about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. What I'm thinking, because he's the imitator, he's the liar, he's the slanderer, he only chooses the lion because Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Whatever Satan does, he's like, I'm going to make them think I'm you. I'm going to get them to worship me. I'm going to intimidate them into worship, or I'm going to entice them, or I'm going to, well, bribe them one way or another. He offers what he can't deliver on. He makes promises he can never keep. When, when things don't work out, he blames you. He tempts you, and then when you fall, he accuses you. Uh, why anyone would follow after the enemy of our souls is beyond me. But that does, in fact, happen. Well, one more thing. If you're looking for a challenge and some extra credit, jot these three passages down just for those looking for a challenge and extra credit. And you're like, I didn't even know we got credit for this. You don't. But so what's extra credit? More of the nothing that you're already getting. No, you'll get more from the word. Numbers chapter 2. If you're like 15 or 22, you can probably just make a mental note. If you're 30 or over, you better write it down. Numbers chapter 2. Look carefully at the camp. Ezekiel chapter 1. Look carefully at Ezekiel's vision. And then Revelation 4, 7, the throne of God that uh, John is given a vision of and, and access to. So Numbers 2, the camp, Ezekiel 1, the vision, and then Revelation 4, 7, the throne of God. And when we get to Numbers, which we will in a couple of weeks on our weekend study, because this week it's Exodus, the book of redemption, then Leviticus, the book of worship, 
then numbers the book of wilderness wandering. So we'll come back to this and I'll tell you what you didn't find or I'll affirm that you did actually discover something for yourself that will pretty much blow you away. I can promise. Well, where are we then? Ah, the king, the princes, the priests, the prophets, they're going to wonder what went wrong. And, and here's what I get from this. They're oblivious because he's been warning them and they're not listening. Now what he said was going to happen happens. And they're like, how did this happen? Sometimes we do that, don't we? We absolutely know if I do this, this is going to happen. But we convince ourselves, now nah, I'll be okay. And then we do it and then it happens. And we're like, what went wrong? If we know better and we do it, we're a greater fool than the, the one who doesn't know and does it. Well, position, power, prestige, that's what these guys have. Relationships, connections, all those things, the respect of their peers and of others, none of them are of any value in the day of judgment. The only thing that would matter in that day is were you listening to and walking in obedience to the Lord? Because many are going to be spared, like Daniel. And if you're thinking, what do you mean spared? They took him to Babylon. They made him a slave. Yeah, but they didn't kill him. And he lives through the Babylonians and the Medo-Persians. And, and, and one king comes and goes and another comes and goes and another comes and goes. And Daniel's still around. And he's being used mightily by God in that very place. So that's what's up with that. Babylon, by the way, verses 10 and 11, a tool in the hand of God. At that time, it will be said to this people in Jerusalem, a dry wind of the desolate heights blows in the wilderness toward the daughter of my people, not to fan or to cleanse. A wind too strong for these will come for me. And now I will speak judgment against them. Behold, he shall come, verse 13, like clouds, then his chariots like a whirlwind, his horse is swifter than eagles. Woe to us, for we are plundered. Oh, Jerusalem, listen to it. We go from the promise of destruction to a, a plea for repentance. Oh, Jerusalem, wash your heart from wickedness that you may be saved. How long shall your evil thoughts lodge within you? For a voice declares from Dan and proclaims affliction from Mount Ephraim. Make mention to the nations, proclaim against Jerusalem that watchers come from a far country and raise their voice against the cities of Judah. Like keepers of a field, they are against her all around because she's been rebellious against me, says the Lord. Your ways and your doings have procured these things for you. This is your wickedness because it's bitter and it reaches to your heart. Listen, these are the Lord's words to his own people. And Jeremiah's response as he has to go and proclaim them is that he cries with a broken heart. I made mention of it and will again. That ministry to a broken people requires ministering with a broken heart. And we see Jeremiah very much like our Lord Jesus, weeping for the people of God. Made mention in our study in Genesis 12 through 50, third part of our series, Jesus from Genesis to Revelation, that no one's more like Jesus in those passages than Joseph. True, over a hundred ways can be found, and I hope you're still exploring them. But you'll see Jesus and, and Joseph. But, but Jeremiah, among the prophets, man, he's known as the weeping prophet. And you'll recall, if you're familiar, that Jesus wept over Jerusalem. 
He knew what was about to happen, and he took no joy in it. It wasn't like, this is what you've got coming. It was like, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who stoned the prophets. And if only you'd heard, if only you'd listened, if only you'd known this was your day. But they didn't listen, and they didn't repent, and they too would see their temple destroyed and the people taken captive and, and murdered by the hundreds of thousands. Oh, my soul, Jeremiah cries in verse 19, my soul, I am pained in my very heart. My heart makes a noise in me. I cannot hold my peace because you've heard, oh, my soul, the sound of the trumpet, the alarm of war, destruction upon destruction is cried. For the whole land is plundered. Suddenly, my tents are plundered, my curtains in a moment. How long will I see the standard and hear the sound of the trumpet? For my people are foolish. They've not known me. They are silly children and they have no understanding. They are wise to do evil. But to do good, they have no knowledge. Verse 22 gives us the why of all these things. That God's people had turned from him and were trusting in anything and everything or anyone but him. When the Assyrians were coming, they cried out to Egypt. When the Egyptians decided, well, we'll attack you, they cried out to the Assyrians. When the Babylonians were coming, they're like, well, let's see, Assyrians or Egyptians, what do we do? No one ever got this figured out. Look up, not north, not south, not west or east. Look up because they could have cried out to the one who actually could have delivered them. Well, verse 23 is a vision of future desolation and devastation. And listen, this is important because we see something similar. We read very similar words in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. This is Jeremiah speaking again here, verse 23 of Jeremiah 4. I beheld the earth, and indeed it was without form and void. In the heavens they had no light. Now, I can't tell you with any absolute certainty if this is a vision of what's coming or if this is what he sees after it's occurred. Because he's around for both, you see. And one of the things that you will notice as you walk through, as we walk through Jeremiah together, is not everything is in chronological order. He'll lay out some things, and then there'll be the historical part, and then he'll lay out some things, and you realize, well, this is actually what he was talking about back there, or this is what's referred to over here. So all I'm saying is he's either looking forward, and quite possibly that's still the case here, and he's seeing the devastation that's so great, it reminds him of what well, we read in the first, first verses of Genesis, that the earth was without form and void, and, and, and the darkness covered the earth. By the way, we'll see in our study this weekend of the Exodus that there's a darkness that overcomes the, the, the people in Egypt, and it's a darkness that could be felt in at last three days. I won't tell you why he attacks the sun or blots out the sun now, but you can read it for yourself. It's early in the book. And you should be reading it. And then try to put it together. Why is he blocking out the sun? Well, anyway, I beheld the mountains, he says, and indeed they trembled and all the hills moved back and forth. I beheld and indeed there was no man. All the birds of the heaven had fled. I beheld and indeed the fruitful land was the wilderness and all its cities were broken down at the presence of the Lord. And his fierce anger. For thus says the Lord, the whole land shall be desolate, yet I will not make a full end. 
For this shall the earth mourn and the heavens above because, or, and the heavens above, excuse me, be black because I have spoken and I've purposed and will not relent nor will I turn back from it. The whole city shall flee from the noise of the horsemen and bowmen. They shall go into the thickets and climb up on the rocks. Every city shall be forsaken. Not a man shall dwell in it. So this would cause us to think he must be looking forward because he's prophesying things. Certainly these have not yet gone down, but would be going down oh so soon. They'll all flee from the horsemen and bowmen. They'll go to the thickets. They'll climb on the rocks. Every city forsaken, not a man dwelling in it. And when you're plundered, what will you do? Though you clothe yourself with crimson, though you adorn yourself with ornaments of gold, though you enlarge your eyes with paint in vain, you will make yourself fair. Get this. People are actually dressing up for the attack. It's like we'll deck ourselves out and when they come they'll be enamored with us and he's saying that ain't gonna happen they're gonna devastate you they're gonna destroy you they're gonna put hooks in your mouth and drag you out of here naked so the really horrible things are on the horizon and and, and people are decking themselves out thinking they're gonna watch it from the wall or something they're gonna be in the midst of it your lovers will despise you, he said. They'll seek your life. Verse 31, I have heard a voice as of a woman in labor. The anguish as of her who brings forth her first child, the voice of the daughter of Zion, bewailing herself. She spreads her hands saying, woe is me now, for my soul is weary because of murders. Get this, as he describes the judgment, it's local. Unlike the flood, that was worldwide. The, the water covering all the hills and all the mountains, everything that breathed that wasn't on the ark died. Well, unlike the flood, this one is local. But we know from our study of Revelation 6 through 19, when God judges next time again, it will be universal. He will devastate not Israel, not Judah, but the planet itself. All those who are in his face and rebel against him and continue in their sin. We get another picture of all of this this weekend, again, because the judgments of the Exodus are local judgments. So local that if you're on one side of the river, you have light, and on the other side of the river, it's dark. Pam and I were talking about this today, and she's like, so how do you think they were having light over there? And the interesting thing is the light they had in their tents was God. And I'm sure of it because he leads them through the wilderness by night in a pillar of fire. And then, it, it, and then in the day by a cloud. But it wasn't like they had candles and they couldn't find any candles in Egypt. He made it so dark in Egypt that there was just no light at all. Because, well, he is the light. He had withdrawn himself. But his people across the river, by the way, when, when uh, judgments are falling, and you'll see it if you're already reading it, you've already seen it. When judgments are falling on the Egyptians, just on the other side again of the river. God's people, things are going pretty good over there comparatively. I mean, devastation here and God's presence here. And that's the difference, you see, not who they were, but who was with them and who was watching out for them. Well, in Jeremiah 5, we see the justice of God's judgment as he brings his charges against them. And he reminds us, there are none righteous, no, not one. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Run to and fro, he says, Jeremiah 5, 1, through the streets of Jerusalem. See now and know, seek her in the open places. Get this, if you can find a man, if there is anyone who executes judgment, who seeks the truth, 
and I will pardon her. Hey, this is on the heels of us looking at Abraham's negotiation for Sodom, where he said, if there's 50, then 45, then 40, then 30, then 20, then 10 righteous, I'll spare all of Sodom for the sake of 10 righteous. There weren't 10 righteous. Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, by the way, were destroyed. But get this, here he's saying, if I can find one righteous person, I'll spare them this judgment. Not that one, all who were around and facing the judgment. Listen, we would have been under God's condemnation were it not for the one righteous person who so loved us, he gave his life for us. He died for our sins. He was buried, he rose again. He's the one righteous. When the scripture says there are none righteous, no, not one, he's talking about among men until the incarnation. Then there was one righteous and that righteous one died that we could have life. All here had corrupted themselves. All God's people were depraved. Now, again, there's always a remnant. So how that actually plays out, I don't know. I can't tell you at this point. I'm sure as we read ahead, we'll see. Though they say, as the Lord lives, surely they swear falsely. Oh, Lord, are your eyes, are not your eyes on the truth? You've stricken them, but they've not grieved. You've consumed them, but they've refused to receive correction. They've made their faces harder than rock. They've refused to return. Therefore, I said, surely these are poor. They are foolish, for they do not know the way of the Lord, the judgment of their God. What's happening? Jeremiah is starting with the poor. And he's preaching to those who you would think would be most receptive because they've been taken advantage of and abused by those in power. But their hearts are hard too. Then he says, surely they're poor, they're foolish, they don't know. I'll go to the great men, verse 5. He says, I'll turn to those who really know something. Those who've who, who've been educated. They, they know the language. They, they've read the word. They've been in the feasts and festivals. I'll go to the great men and speak to them. They've known the way of the Lord, the, the judgment of their God, but these have all together broken the yoke and burst the bonds. Therefore, verse six, a lion from the forest shall slay them. A wolf of the desert shall destroy them. A leopard will watch over their cities. Everyone who goes out from there will be torn in pieces because their transgressions are many and their backslidings have increased. God's heart is always the same. He desires to forgive. Not as will any perish, but all come to repentance. So he requires confession and repentance. And he wasn't seeing that at all. How shall I pardon you? He asked for this, verse 7. Your children have forsaken me, sworn by those that are not gods. When I fed them to the full, then they committed adultery and assembled themselves by troops in the harlots' houses. They were like well-fed, lusty stallions. Everyone neighed after his neighbor's wife. He's reminding us, idolatry and immorality, immorality and idolatry will always be found together because one always leads to the other. There's no way someone can get involved in sexual immorality without ending up in idolatry. And the same thing's true. Idolaters, by and large, you can see at least in Scripture, they end up living immoral lives because they're not worshiping the one holy God. They don't have the Holy Spirit. They're not reading the Holy Word. They don't have the Holy Son of God. Shall I punish them for these things? Verse 9 says the Lord. 
And shall I not, oh, shall I not punish them? Excuse me, quite a different thing, isn't it? And shall I not avenge myself on such a nation as this? Go up on her walls and destroy, but do not make a complete end. Take away her branches, for they are not the Lord's. When you get to the book of Romans, he talks about, and elsewhere, Paul will make mention of the fact that, that Israel was unfaithful. Judah was unfaithful. So God has set them aside, and now he's made us his witness to the world. What they could have been and should have been, but weren't, he's given us opportunity to be. But he warns us, if he broke off the natural branches and grafted us in, shouldn't we fear lest the same thing happen to us? That, that if we think, well, we can do what we want, which I know you don't think that, but we've all heard people say, hey, the grace of God, the grace of God, I mean, Jesus died for it. He knew I was going to do it. All that's true, but... To think it's no big deal to sin against a holy God who so loved you, he gave his only begotten son. Now, here's what we do know. There will always be, there has always been, and there will always be a righteous remnant preserved. But most of the children of Israel and the children of Judah perished because of their immorality and idolatry and unrepentance. The house of Israel and the house of Judah have felt, felt very treacherously with me, says the Lord. They've lied about the Lord and said, it is not he, neither will evil come upon us, nor shall we see sword or famine. And the prophets became wind. I think we would use the word wind bags, you know, blowhards. They weren't prophesying for him it was just hot air for the word is not in them thus it shall be done to them get this you've heard it maybe before you came to christ you even thought it how could a loving god send judgment on a people that you maybe don't really understand listen the question isn't how could a loving God send judgment? It's how could a righteous God not send judgment? And even in the midst of judgment, God still shows mercy. He still points us to the cross. He still reminds us he sent his son for us. Therefore, verse 14, thus says the Lord God of hosts, because you speak this word, Behold, I will make my words in your mouth fire. This people would, and it shall devour them. I will bring a nation against you from afar, O house of Israel, says the Lord. It is a mighty nation, an ancient nation, a nation whose language you do not know, nor can you understand what they say. Their quiver is like an open tomb. They're all mighty men. They shall eat up your harvest and your bread which your sons and daughters should eat. They shall eat up your flocks and herds. They shall eat up your vines and your fig trees. They shall destroy your fortified cities in which you trust with the sword. Listen, Habakkuk, in mercy, I mean, in judgment, remember mercy. And in the midst of God's judgment, he does remember mercy. If not, well, we would all perish in the judgment. Nevertheless, verse 18, in those days, says the Lord, I will not make a complete end of you. And it will be when you say, why does the Lord our God do these things to us? Then you shall answer them just as you forsaken me and serve foreign gods in the land. So you shall serve aliens in a land that is not yours. Babylon, by the way, would be the cure for Judah's ad adultery and idolatry. Once they were allowed to return after the 70-year captivity, while they had other issues and other problems, those weren't really what was going on in them. Why? 
Because God says, hey, you want idols? Here they are. They're everywhere. Well, we'll see that again in Exodus this week. Similar story, similar scene. Well, where does that lead us? Uh, how far down did I get? What? Verse 20? Well, that works for me. Declare this in the house of Jacob. Was he right? Hey, it's a lot of verses. Declare this in the house of Jacob. Proclaim it in Judah. To hear this, so foolish people without understanding, who have eyes and see not, who have ears and hear not. You know when men make idols, they make them in their image. We've seen it in Psalm 115 and Psalm 135. Those who make them become like them. And that's what he's saying here. Hey, you're worshiping things that have eyes, but they can't see and ears, but they can't hear. And now you can't see. And now you can't hear. Because your eyes, you've closed. And your ears, you've stopped up. Do you not fear me? Verse 22 says, the Lord, will you not tremble at my presence? Who have placed the sand at the bound of the sea by a perpetual decree that it cannot pass beyond it? And though its waves toss to and fro, yet they cannot prevail. Though they roar, they cannot pass over. Men, of course, they see God's power in creation. They choose to deny he even exists. Even worse than that, though, these weren't scientific-minded or scientific-blinded atheists. These are God's chosen people. This people, he says, verse 23, has a defiant and rebellious heart. That's the root of the problem, you see. They've revolted and departed. That's the fruit. The actions follow the heart. They do not say in their heart, let us fear the Lord our God who gives rain, both the former and the latter in its season. He reserves for us the appointed weeks of the harvest. They're not saying, let's fear the Lord. Hey, fear of the Lord, beginning of wisdom and knowledge. Without it, men become fools. Regardless of education, regardless of, of all the, 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 the benefits they're born with, without him and a fear of him, men become fools. Well, your iniquities, verse 25, have turned these things away. Your sins have withheld good from you. For among my people are wicked men. That word wicked important. We saw it in our study this weekend. You don't hear it a lot anymore. I think there was a short season where the teens were using it, right? Like That's wicked. Like wicked was good. That was the same time when bad was good, right? Michael Jackson was singing, I'm bad, and we didn't believe him, but he really meant bad. And, and so, well, it, it's important that we see it. Their houses are full of deceit. Oh, they lie in wait as one who sets snares. They set a trap. They catch men as a cage is full of birds. Their houses are full of deceit. These guys weren't just confused. They were depraved and dangerous. And the deceit that was so common among them is still common among us. Listen to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, all evil speaking as newborn babes that desire the pure milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. If you haven't heard it, I'll read it to you one more time. It's important. If you're a young Christian, he's saying, step one, put away all of these habits and these attitudes that are so self-destructive and damaging to the people around you. And then hunger for the word of God. Lay aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and evil speaking. You know why this really hit me? Because if he says to do that at the beginning... How crazy is it that any of us who walked with the Lord for decades would be struggling with malice and deceit or hypocrisy or envy or evil speaking? That stuff's supposed to go in the beginning. 
and it should never find its way back into our lives. Therefore, he says, verse 27, latter part, therefore they become great and grown rich. Fame, riches, they're not sinful in and of themselves. How they're attained may be and often is. God made Solomon famous. God made Solomon rich. But judges all who gain either by taking advantage of others, especially the weak, the powerless, and the poor. They've grown fat, verse 28. They are sleek. I was confused by that because I thought fat and sleek were sort of opposites, but sleek means polished and shiny here. So, so it, it, I immediately thought of a politician, you know, not one particular politician, but, you know, they're taking advantage, they're growing fat, they're, you know, but, but you know what God showed me? I better check myself before I start thinking about them. Could this happen to me? And, and listen, could it happen to us? And the answer is absolutely yes, it could. And we need to make sure it doesn't. Yes, they surpass the deeds of the wicked. They don't please the cause, the cause of the fatherless. Yet they prosper. And the right of the needy, they do not defend. Shall I not punish them for these things, says the Lord? Shall I not avenge myself on such a nation as this? An astounding and horrible thing has been committed in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely. The priests rule by their own power. And my people love to have it so. But what will you do in the end? Hey, as we prepare our hearts for communion, as we prepare to take the bread and the cup and to remember the one who gave his life that we could have life, listen, 2 Timothy 4.1 Prophets, priests, people, he says, preach the word. I'll pick up at verse two. Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they'll heap up for themselves teachers. They'll turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. So much has changed from the time that these things were written, the things in Jeremiah, 600 years before Christ, and then the things that Paul says to Timothy 2,000 years ago. And yet so much is the same. The prophets prophesy falsely. The priest rule by their own power. My people love to have it so, but what will you do in the end? Lord, help us, enable us to see that the heart of the problem is truly a problem of the heart. And you're not looking for lip service from us tonight. You're not looking for a tear and then the same, the same bent heart that's idolatrous and immoral and, and uncaring. And well, Lord, we are prone to so much that not only displeases you, but dishonors you, that misrepresents you. Our culture surrounds us with things that are not you, Lord, not of you, not from you. And we look on them and the enemy entices us with them. And our hearts say, man, yeah, yeah. So show us, Lord, tonight as we take the bread and take the cup, as we worship you, that it's about a change of heart, that you want us to love you with all our heart and soul and mind and strength. Show us, Lord, if we are or if we aren't. To love one another, our neighbor, as ourselves. That's easier, Lord. We're either caring for one another or we're just flat out not. So may this be a time, Lord, where our hearts cry out to you as Jeremiah's did, where our hearts break before you as Jeremiah's did. And if you're here and you've never said, Jesus, come into my life, be my Lord, be my Savior, forgive my every sin. 
Today's the day of salvation. We're about to take the bread and the cup, and we're about to remember the one who gave his life for us. We sang it. He gave his life away. No one takes my life from me, Jesus said. I have power to lay it down and power to take it up again. Right now, right where you sit, if you've never given your life to the one who gave his life for you, you raise your hand and hold it high. So we can pray together. So I can introduce you to the one who created you. Is that, a, you, you want to give your life to the Lord tonight? Awesome, wonderful, sister. Anybody else ready to say yes, me too, right now, right here? Join the sister and, and surrender to the one who offers you forgiveness and bled and died to make that forgiveness possible. Anyone else before we pray? You who raise your hand and anyone else who wants to pray along, pray aloud after me. Heavenly Father, thank you for seeing me, for calling me, for speaking to me, for softening my heart, for convicting me of sin and convincing me of your love. Thank you for sending Jesus who died for my sin, was buried, and rose again. He gave his life for me. So I give my life to you. There's so much I don't understand, but I believe you've forgiven me every sin. And my life is in you. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. In your precious name I pray. Amen.